Hey guys, this is Jennifer. Um, welcome to the show today. We are joined um, by by Bradley, one of the uh, engineers on the Power Apps team. We are so super excited to have him. So we are going to um, jump right in and um, let Bradley do an introduction to himself. I'll first give a quick introduction to myself. I'm Jennifer Mason, um, SharePoint server um, MVP. I spend a lot of time working with power users and um, business users and people that can do things with uh, SharePoint no-code solutions. And so I'm super excited about Power Apps and um, what it can do for us as we're looking at the future and different things along those lines. And so, Bradley, I'd love to um, kind of give the show over to you and we can get started with the day and you can kind of um, show us your camera and, and do an introduction and I will make you the presenter and, and we can just get started. Sounds good. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you great. Okay, great. Uh, so my name is Brad Millington, and uh, I'm a program manager on um, on Power Apps. And I'm really excited to talk to you about it today. Uh, we've just had our big debut, and so um, this is all fresh content. And uh, I love it. Thanks for coming. It's so so awesome that you guys are coming and and making a scene so early and and showing people the good stuff. So we totally appreciate you being here. Not a problem. I'm excited. Uh, and so I've been on Azure uh, for, for a long time. I've worked on various features of that platform from uh, the front end management portal to deployment from source code control. That was a feature um, I worked on. Um, I've been in uh, Visual Studio and web development for years. Uh, so that's my background. Uh, but today we're going to talk about building cross-platform uh, business-facing mobile applications uh, in kind of a brand new way. So. Yeah, and I guess, uh, Bradley, before we get started, I should let everybody know there is a questions box inside of uh, GoToMeeting or GoToWebinar, and so if you post your questions, um, then once Bradley is done with his presentation, we'll kind of do a Q&A, and you guys can um, just put all your questions there, and um, we'll get to them at the end of the, at the, end of the presentation. So I think, that's, I think that's it. I will try not to interrupt anymore. Awesome. So I'm going to uh, uh, kill my cam and start my screen sharing, if that's okay. Yeah, um, definitely. Okay. And let me know when you can see my desktop. Yes, we can see your desktop. Awesome. Let me maximize this presentation and we'll get started. Okay. Uh, so. As I said, uh, we're going to talk about Microsoft Power Apps today, uh, kind of a new way to build business-facing uh, business cross-platform mobile applications uh, and kind of allows really anybody um, in an enterprise uh, to do this, not just uh, a professional developer. Um, so uh, for starters, I kind of want to just set, set the stage, talk a little bit about the, the, the the context and the background that led us um, to think about Power Apps uh, as, a, as a solution. And if you look back at the way that um, you know that we used to do work, maybe even just five years ago, um, at least here at Microsoft, I know I would come uh, into work and um, sit down at a desk uh, to a desktop computer that was tethered to my desk and tied to the corporate network, and uh, and I would basically do most of my work there. You know, I would use um, client server applications, you know, internal applications right there on my desktop um, to do to do my job. Um, and yes, we had remote access and stuff, so I could certainly take that work home with me on my on my laptop. But really, um, uh, I was in, uh, my work life was pretty much always tethered to that uh, corporate environment, corporate uh, network. Um, and the way we um, are working today is quite different. You know, we're um, as we talk to customers and we sort of observe the way that we work today, uh, we find that we're taking more and more of our work with us and on the go. Um, it's really uh, work kind of finds us w wherever we are. Um, I know that in my day-to-day -day job I use tools like uh, Trello or uh, Slack. Um, of course I use email and calendar, uh, but you know I'll, I'll have my to-do list on my phone. I'll have a, you know, a bunch of kind of mobile applications that I'm using um, to get my job done. And a lot of those mobile applications are sort of uh, uh, apps tied to some SaaS offering like, like Trello or Slack, for example. Um, and, uh, and and actually, this is this is true kind of everywhere, um, not just in software companies. Uh, more and more companies are utilizing mobile devices to to be able to empower their workforce. Um, think about the sales field. Uh, uh, you know, your field folks uh, going out and talking to customers, 
you know, they, they effectively want to be able to um, tie back to, to their data or their product inventories, um, you know, wherever they are. Uh, similarly, like a retail employee on a, on a showroom floor, um, you know, or a warehouse employee, you know, uh, you know, out, out in the, out in the warehouse, you know, might, might use a mobile device to um, stay connected to, to those, uh, to the information that they need to do their jobs as well. So it isn't just a software company thing. And, uh, but when you think about, you know, some of the applications that you use day to day for work though, a lot of them really haven't changed. Um, I know that uh, here at Microsoft we have a lot of uh, apps that we use to run our day-to-day -day business and, and they're still tied to legacy corporate systems um, that are either sort of client server systems or maybe uh, web applications but they, they only work if I'm uh, on the corporate network um, whether it's our time and absence reporting or the, the tool we use to give uh, interview feedback um, some of those kind of applications or expense reports for that matter um, they're all basically still done using these systems that haven't changed a whole lot um, and you know, we ask ourselves, you know, you know, why is that? Um, when I look at my consumer life, I've installed dozens of applications uh, that enhance my my personal life and my life as a consumer. Um, those apps are rapidly evolving and always changing, and there's always some kind of something new. Um, but yet, my you know my expense reporting tool is the same tool I effectively the same tool I, I I've used since I started you know years ago at this company. So, you know, why is that? What's holding us back? Um, and when we look at that, I um, think there's, there's a bunch of reasons why we're not seeing um, enterprise mobile applications evolve at the same pace as consumer applications. Uh, Gartner uh, um, would say, uh, uh, sort of makes a prediction here that, that um, uh, demand for apps in the mobile space is, is actually outpacing and outstripping our um, our developer capacity by five to one. So, you know, there's just uh, too much demand for applications and not enough expertise inside of an, or an organization to deliver the kinds of applications that people require. Uh, so that's that's kind of a staggering staggering uh, statistic there. Uh, and if we look a little bit deeper as to you know why that is, um, there's really a few different a few different reasons. Um, one is uh, the ability to connect to data. Uh, wherever it is. So, you know, data access is still relatively hard. Um, we have data that's kind of locked behind uh, legacy uh, on-premises systems um, where you need to kind of go through multiple hoops in internally to get access to that data. Um, you know, IT still manages those back-end systems to a large degree. Uh, and it's, it's kind of hard to get, you know, connected to that data. Um, and then often we need to aggregate data across multiple sources. You know, maybe you need to talk to an on-premise system. You need to be able to put, you know, data, aggregate data from, you know, SharePoint or Office 365. Um, you need to be able to talk to some of these uh, SaaS systems, you know, that I mentioned before, Slack or, or something else. And you want to stitch, uh, or Salesforce for that matter, you want to stitch all that data together to do something interesting and new. And it's kind of hard to stitch together data from multiple sources. Um, and uh, whether it's on-prem or in the cloud, it's still very difficult. So that's one thing. Uh, the second thing is, uh, as uh, that Gartner statistic indicates, is that we just don't have the dev capacity to, to handle the, uh, the demand for this. Uh, to build a mobile application, it's a very specialized skill set. You have to be, you know, quite a, uh, quite a, uh, you know, skilled developer. Um, you know, it's not your everyday dev that's, you know, writing Xcode and Eclipse. Um, knows how to handle uh, you know cross-platform um, scenarios and build an app multiple times to handle all the you know all the different platforms it needs to run on. Um, it's just uh, we just don't have the devs to handle that that task, um, particularly in enterprise organizations. Uh, and then thirdly, the agility with which IT can build mobile apps and get them deployed into the business is still pretty low. Um, we can use mobile device management solutions like uh, Intune, for example, and we can you know, force employees to install uh, those, uh, those solutions and then push applications out to, to the workforce. Um, but that's, there's still a fair amount of friction in, in doing that. Um, and likewise, with enterprise uh, business store solutions that allow uh, employees to sideload app, side apps, um, that also inherently has a lot of friction. It's not something that you know, is just readily available um, uh, to uh, to most employees, and so um, IT's agility is sort of a third a third thing that we think is an impediment to 
to deploying mobile applications in, in the enterprise. So with all that said, uh, let's introduce Microsoft Power Apps. Um, we think Power Apps is really the, uh, a great solution that, that looks at these problems and tries to address them. Uh, Power Apps is an enterprise SaaS solution that allows innovators to connect uh, to the data that they want wherever it lives and create business apps, uh, no matter who you are in that enterprise, whether you're a pro dev or you're um, you know, a typical office user. Uh, and then you can share them in just seconds. Um, so the time to actually you know, share out an application you've built with your colleagues is as easy as um, sending an email or you know, sharing a link to a SharePoint site or, or something along those lines. So that, that's Power Apps in a nutshell. Um, uh, we can connect to data everywhere, no matter where it is, whether on-prem or uh, in the cloud. Um, all the common data sources uh, uh, we're able to talk to, whether it's Office 365, um, SharePoint, Dynamics, uh, uh, Google Drive, uh, OneDrive, Dropbox, Salesforce, um, you name it. Uh, and we're working on more and more connectors every day. Uh, pretty much anywhere there's interesting data for your business, uh, we can connect to it. Uh, next, we're also a cross-platform solution. So when you build a Power App, uh, you build it uh, once, and you're able to run it across a variety of platforms, whether it's uh, iOS, uh, Android, or Windows. Uh, and we're even working on a web on a web solution, uh, both for authoring and and uh, from a runtime perspective. So uh, write a write a Power App once and run it on uh, any device, any form factor, any OS. Uh, approachability is also a key principle for us. Um, we, as I said, you know, you don't have to be a pro developer to write a Power App. Uh, we've taken a lot of the learnings from Office over the last decade uh, to to try to understand what it is that, that's approachable to your typical Office user, what kind of concepts um, you know they're they're used to working with. Uh, and if you think about you know somebody who say is in you know, finance or sales, and they're wading through data uh, all day long. Um, they're used to Excel. They're used to formulas. They're used to you know writing expressions to kind of manipulate that data. Um, so it isn't you know it isn't that that, uh, uh, that that they aren't dealing with complexity. Of course, they're dealing with complexity. They're working with that complexity on a day-to-day -day basis, and they're doing manipulations of that data to to create new business insights. Um, we want. Uh, your typical office user to be able to take those same skills that they have today and apply them to the to the practice of building a mobile application that gives them those same insights and uh, and that they can share with their colleagues. So, again, approachability is something we've been paying uh, uh, quite a lot of attention to. No, I guess all those talking points I just uh, uh, spoke to are are kind of in this uh, in this slide here. Uh, we'll move on. So, um, connecting to data. So, uh, so first of all, I, as I mentioned, we can connect to data no matter where it is, um, whether it's public SaaS, uh, uh, so like Workday or Concur or Salesforce, you know, some of these SaaS systems uh, that you're used to talking to today. Uh, uh, Power Apps lets you aggregate data from those sources uh, as well as write to those sources. Um, Office 365, Dynamics, uh, all those SaaS services are supported. Um, we also make it easy to connect to um, enterprise services that you might have you know, behind the firewall, like your on-premises ERP systems like SAP and others. Um, and lastly, if you have custom business systems, like I mentioned our interview feedback uh, or expense reporting tools that we have here at Microsoft or our time and absence reporting tools, um, those are all kind of custom backends that our IT department has built. Uh, in a custom way, um, and so we, we make it possible for IT to expose that data in a way that is uh, easily approachable and consumable from within the Power Apps authoring environment as well, um, while still kind of allowing IT to maintain that central control over those, those business systems, those custom business systems. So we'll get a little bit into more detail when we do the demos, um, just exactly how that works. Uh, but just suffice to say that Power Apps can connect to data all over the place. Um, creating data, uh, so we want obviously people to be able to create new business solutions that empower the workforce, that enable new insights uh, that you might not otherwise have. Um, we want people to be able to take advantage of uh, device capabilities like geolocation or the camera or sensors to be able to do interesting and innovative new things uh, with these mobile applications. Um, and as I mentioned before, uh, uh, non um, a a uh, non-pro developer can can do this. Uh, we've made it very approachable. That said, the underlying um, the underlying stack 
that um, that Power Apps talks to uh, is based in in uh, a set of Azure offerings that are available to the pro developer that do have first class tooling for those developers building native applications with Xcode or using Eclipse uh, or Visual Studio. Um, they can effectively leverage those same connectors uh, to business systems and enterprise services. Um, all the same manageability applies uh, to those um, to like a pro dev. Uh, kind of environment uh, as it would to um, your your uh, kind of office user or, or business user development environment. Um, so just know that there's a kind of a common substrate that uh, allows both pro developers and office users alike to create apps. Uh, and then lastly, uh, sharing is a key key component. We want to make it easy to just share these applications with your colleagues. Um, and it's really as simple as entering the email address of a colleague and hitting send on the mail. Uh, and uh, so much, much in the way you might share a, a link to a SharePoint site, you can now share out those mobile applications um, with your colleagues and grant them um, access to that, that data that, that supports those apps. So we look at uh, uh, the range of applications that you might create with Power Apps, and um, we've, we've been uh, kind of dogfooding this ourselves uh, internally. Um, trying to uh, build out some some apps here in, internally to Microsoft that are interesting, and we kind of look at you know three three kinds of applications that you might uh, consider. Um, one is uh, kind of new applications that uh, might uh, normally be cost prohibitive to build. So uh, you know, what if you want to run an employee survey, or you're just running a um, a, a two week giving campaign, and you want um, people to participate in that? Um, so it's sort of a time constrained scenario, or maybe you just want to sign up people for booth duty at the latest uh, tech conference. Um, those kind of things you wouldn't normally think of a mobile application to do because um, honestly, it's just too cost prohibitive to build something that you're going to use for two weeks and throw away. Um, so, but we think Power Apps is going to enable r rapid creation of mobile applications that um, might enable you to build these kinds of apps uh, for even just kind of disposable scenarios, right? Where uh, where you're just going to use it uh, maybe for a limited time and and uh, and toss it. So, kind of think of it as um, Power Apps enables new ways to engage your employees um, in ways that you might not otherwise have have thought to use a mobile app for. Uh, another uh, kind of application are um, those kinds of um, uh, uh, apps that that might help you run your business, like um, issue tracking systems or Maybe you want your uh, field sales uh, folks to, to be able to get access to breaking customer news related to their CRM accounts um, so they can take um, kind of action um, and be you know, well informed as they're talking to their customers about the day-to-day the -day news. Um, assistive sales kind of experiences. These are things where you know, traditionally a mobile app, like um, the, the fact that you can build a mobile app so rapidly should get you thinking about ways that mobile apps can empower your workforce uh, in, in ways that you might you know, not have uh, not have done before, so um, that's that's kind of another category. It's like in, uh, new innovations that um, only a mobile app could could enable um, that would allow you to run your business um, wherever you are. Uh, the third thing would be um, to be to be able to go back to some of those legacy mission critical systems uh, and um, and mobilize them. So kind of uh, take the dust off of some of those systems that haven't uh, that haven't really evolved over the years. And um, and give them a fresh face, and do that uh, in a way that you can kind of expose uh, the data from those applications, from those legacy enterprise services, in kind of a standard way that IT can con continue to manage, um, but empower people to build new experiences on top of those systems. So those are just a few examples of um, what we think Power Apps can enable. Finish with just a few more slides, and then we're just going to jump into demos. Uh, just talking a bit about the audience, I want to recap kind of who is Power Apps for. Uh, first, it's for business users, uh, and business users, office users, they can innovate um, on their own. Um, and we've made, as I said, a, a really approachable experience that lets you use um, uh, a desktop tool, uh, a, a portal, a mobile application for building and sharing applications with your colleagues, um, and bringing together all the data that you care about in one place. Uh, I mentioned as well that pro developers uh, have a story with Power Apps as well. All of the backend systems that Power Apps is talking to uh, um, apply equally well to pro developer. In
environment. Um, and we've got a lot of great uh, offerings in uh, Azure and in uh, Visual Studio tooling, for example, that uh, make building uh, native applications, pro developer, pro developed applications really easy and they can leverage a lot of the same backend systems and access to APIs that, uh, that Power Apps does. Um, and lastly, um, I mentioned that IT can expose data and manage data in, um, in kind of a centralized uh, way. And that's a key component of Power Apps as well. We want um, IT to be able to govern, uh, monitor, secure access, um, uh, look at telemetry and understand uh, usage patterns inside of the enterprise. Uh, we've got a bunch of great experiences in the Azure Management Portal for getting a glimpse at what's happening under the hood in Power Apps, uh, as well as um, exposing um, maybe custom, you know, custom backends uh, that IT can control, but that business users and pro developers can build new experiences on. Uh, and we'll see a little bit of that in the demos as well. I'll finish off by saying uh, that everyone started for free. Uh, we we do have an offering that you know is going to let everybody um, you know take a, take advantage of, of Power Apps. Um, uh, from the get-go, and then of course we will have a, uh, a pricing model and a, and a SKU model around um, how some of those uh, deeper IT management uh, features work uh, in terms of you know um, kind of full centralized governance and, and things along those lines as well. We're in limited preview right now, so uh, it's an invite-only uh, experience uh, just for a few weeks while we onboard customers in a gradual way. Uh, we had a, an announcement a couple of weeks ago. Um, uh, at Convergis, and uh, that was sort of our kickoff and our debut. And now we're um, now we're gradually starting to onboard customers, and uh, we expect to be open to the public early next year. Let's go ahead and see it in action then. So I'm here in the uh, Power Apps uh, authoring environment on Windows, and uh, I want to go ahead and show you, give you kind of, kind of a tour of um, of how you would build apps in, in a few different ways. So the first thing you see when you start this authoring environment is how do you want to start? And um, we have three different ways you can start. One is from a template, uh, another is from uh, connecting to data, and another is just starting from scratch, starting from a blank canvas and kind of building up an app uh, piecemeal on your own. Um, and we think templates and, and starting from data are going to be really great ways for people just to um, get started rapidly, especially if you're not familiar with the platform. Um, you can learn the platform um, by uh, leveraging these kind of quick start, uh, quick starter um, techniques. So let's talk about templates a little bit. If I, um, if I start from a template, uh, we, we will show you a list of um, available templates. Now, we only have a few templates at the moment. Um, we have nine today. We're working on several more. I, I think we're going to ship uh, maybe six more this week. Um, you, should, you should start seeing uh, this gallery fill up uh, fairly rapidly, and we, we hope to get to hundreds of templates uh, in short order. Um, the idea with templates is you get a uh, ready-to-use, out-of-the-box uh, application that um, already satisfies some uh, fairly focused scenario, uh, and it's backed by sample data. So for example, if I need a, a budget tracking application, this one manage, helps me manage uh, budgets and allocations of budgets across different categories, and I can see um, uh, you know, some charting across different categories and so on, see whether I'm on budget. Um, here's a conference agenda application that lets me, maybe I'm running a small one-day seminar and I want to you know, ship out a mobile app that has um, that has a list of sessions and the speakers and speaker bios, and I want to let people sign up for sessions or um, you know add things to their favorites or something. This would be a great starter for that. Um, contacts, uh, you know, basically a basic contact card application, which you can imagine using in a broader scenario, like um, you know you're building something for your field sales to keep track of their of their customers and their contacts. And you know maybe I start from this template and I add things like geolocation and you know other other features to it. Um, we have a tool here for event sign up, um, various things, catalogs, um, you know, kind of product inventory looking stuff, um, employee surveys. As I mentioned, we're going to build hundreds of these things. This is just the beginning. Uh, let's take a look at one of them. So here I've got an event sign up, a uh, simple two-page application. Um, again, all these are backed by sample data. The sample data is in um, Excel. 
Uh, and so, uh, oh, one other thing I want to mention is that we have both phone and tablet form, form factors for these. So, you know, if I want to use those same applications in a tablet form factor, um, here's that catalog application uh, for, for tablet, for example. I can go ahead and uh, start from that as well. Um, so, I have instantiated an event sign-up uh, template here, and I just wanted to, to show you one of them in action. Um, it's, it's got two screens, um, and it just allows me to sign up, uh, sign up uh, people for uh, time slots. So here on the second page, you can see there's different time slots with um, people's names and sign up buttons where there, there is no name. Uh, and I can go ahead and preview that application uh, to kind of emulate what it looks like running inside of a mobile device. And uh, I might um, select here, I'm, uh, there's some sample data asking the user to pick a t-shirt size. Maybe I'm signing people up for booth duty. Um, and then I click on next and I can see the list of names. Um, notice I get a notification here that an Excel file was updated in my Dropbox. Um, Dropbox was my preferred storage provider, so when I created the template, it, it dropped this Excel file out there. Um, and for those templates that have images, it'll drop the sample images out in um, Dropbox as well. And you can replace them with your own images. You can replace the data in the Excel spreadsheet with your own data. Um, and this just kind of shows like a simple, you know, what the back end actually looks like. Um, we just went with Excel because it's really, really approachable and easy uh, for people to understand and, and modify data. And, and in many cases, you know, an Excel backed uh, a mobile app is, is perfectly good enough. Now, if you wanted to connect this to a different system, you could certainly just uh, apply the same schema to some other back end, like you know, Dynamics or something else, and, uh, and wire that up uh, as well. Um, but so for simplicity's sake, we've made all of our templates backed by um, Excel data that's dropped to the storage provider of your choice, uh, whether it's SharePoint, uh, OneDrive, or Dropbox. Um, and then if I want to sign up um, for a particular slot, I can go ahead and click one of these buttons and uh, it'll sign me up, and then if I want to not sign up, I can uh, check the box, and it will not sign me up. And you can see in the, back, in the background, I'm getting these notifications of the Excel files being updated um, as I interact with the app. Now, just to underscore the point that these things do, in fact, run on a mobile device, I'm going to go ahead and, and share, um, share my phone here with, uh, with my screen. So uh, here's my phone. Um, nothing surprising here. It's an iPhone. Uh, but you can see in the lower right-hand corner, I'm, I've got the Power Apps uh, client installed to that phone as well. And so I can click on uh, that. And here I have that exact same application um, running in the context of my phone. And uh, just as before, I can select a t-shirt size. I can click uh, Next and uh, navigate to the second screen. And now I can see that exact same data and go ahead and um, you know sign up for sign up for a slot and so on. So it works as you would expect on a mobile device. Um, and yeah, so just uh, wanted to underscore the point that, um, that uh, it's there. And again, I, I mentioned that sharing these applications is really easy. Suppose I created this template and I modified the data a little bit or I cleared out the Excel spreadsheet because I wanted to um, sign up uh, new people for new slots. And uh, then I want to share it with my team. Um, so from both the, the authoring environment on the desktop as well as the authoring environment uh, or the runtime environment on my phone, I can um, see all the applications that I have and I can quickly share them with my colleagues. So you can see here I've got a list of applications, um, one of which is this event sign up. And if I click on info, uh, you can see that um, some of the things I can do with this is uh, I can share it, I can pin this, I can obviously delete it or open the app. Um, but if I click on share, uh, here I have a very simple interface for sharing this out with my team, and I can go ahead and type in, say, a member of my, um, of my current organization, um, and notice that it's auto-completing against my, um, my Active Directory. So I'm logged in to uh, Power Apps using Brad, uh, my current email address, bradmi at microsoft.com, and so it knows I'm a member of the Microsoft uh, organization, and so it's auto-completing against uh, my colleagues. Um, you know, right here in this in this app, and I can hit share. It's going to turn around and share that application um, with my with my colleagues, and um, he'll basically get an email that um, that says he can uh, uh, he can go ahead and uh, download and install the app for himself. So, pretty straightforward so far. Uh, let's actually take a look at. Um, let me go ahead and close this preview. And uh, it looks like it just completed. Uh, it's been shared successfully. Great. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my phone.
All right. So uh, let's go back to file new here and take a look at another way I might want to start to build an app. Um, so the second way I can build an app is starting from data. Uh, so whereas a template kind of is a ready a ready built application with screens that target a particular business scenario, um, we also have uh, the ability to start from a data source, just some structured data, and scaffold an application for you. So say for example you have a SharePoint list, um, you know, or an Excel file, or or uh, you know even um, you know, even a dynamic CRM, you know, schema or something. Uh, so I might start from a particular uh, form of data and then be able to rapidly build out an application. Um, in this case, I have a SharePoint list, and we're going to go ahead and use that. So um, when I click on Start from Data, I get, get a list of uh, um, connectors that I can use. And I already have some connections to some data that I use often, Dropbox, Dynamics, Google Drive, uh, SharePoint Online, and the SQL database. Uh, and if I go out to... Uh, here, uh, you can see that I have a SharePoint list. This is a uh, you know, list of products. It's got uh, prices, uh, an approver column, a discount, and so on. And if we come out here, I can click on SharePoint. And uh, it's actually somewhere in here. I've got, I've got the link to the SharePoint site. Let's find this. Scratch. Here we go. Let's go back to Power Apps. Um, okay, so I can click on New Site, and I'm going to go ahead and paste the URL to that SharePoint site that we just looked at, and click Connect. And now it's listing out for me the list of um, SharePoint lists on that site, and I'll click on MS Devices, which is the one we looked at. And what Power Apps is doing at this moment is it's looking at the structure of my SharePoint list and trying to determine um, the best way to represent that data. So it's trying to glean as much metadata as it can. In my case, I have um, images in my list. Uh, I have a price, some price information and so on. I have a, a discount percentage. Um, and so what it's chosen to do is create a, a list of items, um, each backed by an image and uh, the title of the, uh, of the product. Um, and then uh, it's given me other screens for um, viewing the details about a particular item or editing the item or inserting a new item and so on. Now on the right hand side I have uh, some choices about layouts. So if I don't like this single column layout I can choose a different one. So for example if I want to pick a two column layout I can do that and the app kind of reflows um, to give me a, a new starting point. Um, now I can go in and choose specifically which fields I want to bind to this layout. So it, it chose title and, appro and approver by default for some reason, but I can change that back to the image if I want to bind um, you know, the, the second field to, to an image instead. Um, other things we can do, so I can go in and, and choose a look and feel for my application. So um, kind of as easy as it would be in, say, an Office application, I can pick uh, from different themes uh, to give it a, a different look and feel. And when I find one I like, um, I can go ahead and uh, save this thing or publish it and, and share it, like I said. Um, so I can run this app. Let's take a look at what it does. Uh, I can click on um, different items here. And here I can see um, details about an item. Notice that we optimized the rendering of the discount percentage as a bar um, with a, like a filled up bar. Um, just again, we're trying to optimize the, the controls that we render by default to be kind of optimized around um, you know, whatever the device uh, happens to be. Uh, if I want to go ahead and edit an item, I can edit this item. Uh, I could, for example, change the approver um, from Merwan to myself. Uh, and I'll go ahead and hit uh, save here. And if we uh, come back out to the SharePoint list, um, we can see for the, uh, I think it was Lumia 950 at the bottom, that was Merwan. Um, if I go ahead and, and hit refresh here, we should see that the SharePoint list has been updated from the mobile app to be me. So it works as you would expect. It's just kind of um, uh, CRUD op operations against a uh, SharePoint list. And so on. So um, let's talk a little bit about, about uh, how I might customize this app, you know, take it a little bit further. So uh, imagine I have a scenario where I want to share this app with some customers and, um, you know, or with my suppliers or something, and, and they, they, wanna, uh, they want to be able to, to ask for a, specific, for a discount of a specific amount. So rather than a read-only discount, I want to give them the ability to, uh, to ask for a certain amount. So in this case, what I want to do is allow them to interactively choose a discount amount, and then I want to give them a button where they can submit that, uh, that request and ask for approval. Uh, 
And you can see that um, we have an approver field, so we know who to send the approval to. So let's uh, do some, a little bit of customizations to the UI, and then I'm going to show you uh, a concept called uh, a logic flow um, that will uh, let us wire up the business logic to actually send the approver um, emails and everything. And again, doing that um, not as a developer, but as you know, a typical business user in an enterprise. Uh, okay, so for that, um, I'm going to go ahead and select the discount field. And uh, if I go back over to the content screen, I can see the, the set of fields that are bound on this page. Um, and for the discount, I've got it highlighted here. And I can click over here to look at alternate representations of that particular field. Um, now, it's rendered as a bar chart today, but maybe I want to render it as uh, a slider, for example, so that someone can interactively choose um, a new discount. So I'll pick on, I'll choose slider, and we can see here that it's actually changed now to be um, an interactive slider. And then I can go write maybe some uh, formulas here, you know, to, uh, to format that a little differently. I'm just going to add the percent, uh, the percent sign. Um, this formula bar up at the top is uh, something that we think will be fairly approachable to your typical Excel user. You know, they, uh, you can type uh, expressions up here. We've got a lot of built-in um, functions and stuff that will let you do um, nice manipulations of data. And as you get deeper into Power Apps, um, you'll use these expressions more and more to kind of build um, uh, it's kind of some simple, simple logic uh, into your applications. Uh, and then I'll go ahead and add uh, a section to this details page, and let's insert a new control. In this case, it's going to be a button. I'm going to go ahead and select the text for that button, and I'm going to say request um, discount approval, and say OK. And so we've got this button wired up. Now we want this button to do something. I want someone to be able to request uh, a discount amount. Um, so uh, let's segue into a different aspect of Power Apps, which is um, Power Flows. And for that, I'm going to go ahead and um, go to the Power Apps uh, website. Uh, looks like I need to authenticate. Give me a second. All sorts of authentication options. Oops, it looks like I've forgotten how to authenticate. So I'm logging in here as uh, Brad and I at Microsoft.com. And uh, so this is a portal representation of Power Apps. Um, it's a, kind of a web front end for some of the same stuff we just saw. Um, and again, I can make an app directly from here. I can um, go ahead and... Uh, and um, you know, choose to create, create an app from a template, for example, from right here. Um, I can also uh, make a, a logic flow. So this is something, something new that we haven't talked about yet. Um, a logic flow is a way that I can wire up some, you know, back-end back -end logic, back-end rules. Now, normally I would require, like, a pro developer to build, a, you know, APIs to do this kind of stuff. Um, but as a business user, you know, we, we want to provide a, a kind of out-of-box experience for them. To, uh, to create simple common workflows. And you can see that we have a template gallery for uh, workflows as well. Um, so I can, I can uh, you know, archive emails to Dropbox, or I can send an approval mail, um, create leads from Salesforce by received emails. We have a bunch of out-of-the-box templates. And again, we have a few now. We expect to have hundreds. Um, and, but we're going to go ahead and create one from blank. So I can show you what it looks like to create one of these um, logic flows. Uh, and it's sort of like building up uh, something out of Lego blocks and uh, creating kind of branching uh, conditional expressions and stuff um, to be, you know, to represent the different uh, forks in the logic that I have. So in my case, I want um, to do something when a control is selected. And the whole point of this flow is we're going to send an approver uh, an email uh, and tell them that someone has requested a discount and then give them the opportunity to, to approve or reject that and then, uh, then send an email back to the requester telling them whether or not their request was approved. And then I'm also going to go ahead and put a record in my dynamic CRM um, to uh, represent the discount amount if I approve. Uh, so that's kind of a set of back-end steps that I want to do um, behind the scenes for my Power App. So I'll add an action. And in this action, I'm going to uh, type approve or approval. And uh, we have a send approval email as one of the Office 365 actions um, that we have kind of built in. And uh, this will send an, an email with um, buttons for approve and reject. And I could add other options if I want. We're just going to stick with approve and reject. And then who do I want to send the email to? Um, in this case, I'm going to say ask in Power Apps. And this will let me wire up uh, this as a parameter 
to a field in the Power App. So recall on the Power App I have an approval um, email address and I'm going to supply that value to this uh, workflow um, from the Power App itself. So I'm just giving it a placeholder for now. And then I can go ahead and add to the body some message. So I'm going to say please approve a discount of and then we'll give a certain percent. I'll say ask in Power Apps again. So I'm going to create a parameter for the discount amount um, for and then I'm going to create another another uh, parameter to be the product. So please approve a discount of some percent for some product. Now that uh, I've formatted that mail, uh, let's go ahead and add another action. In this case, uh, I need to know who to send the, the, uh, the mail back to after I approve or reject it. So I'm going to go ahead and get the profile information for the user who's making the request. Um, and again, that's just another built-in um, operation that, uh, that I should just be able to wire up. So I'll just do like get a profile, and now I know who to send the um, who to send the uh, email back to. Um, so let's go ahead and add now a condition, and I want to choose what happens when the approver either approves or rejects the mail. So first, I have to set up some condition to test for. In this case, um, I can see outputs from the send approval mail, and one of those is the selected option. In other words, what the approver chose to do. So the selected option, if it's equal to approve. I'm going to type in approve here. Um, that's the condition I want to test for. So if the selected option is equal to approve, then if yes, I want to do one thing, and if no, I want to do another. Uh, so in the case of yes, I want to go ahead and tell the requester that their, that their request was approved. So um, let's type in email. I want to send an email back to the person who's... Um, who made the request, so I'll say send email. And this subject, I'm going to put, um, uh, we'll say your request has been approved. And then uh, for the body, let's say, um, the, uh, so I, again, I have placeholders for all those parameters. I'm going to say send approval email to, which is that parameter for the person we sent it to. So uh, has approved your request for discount of, and let's pick that first uh, parameter, a certain percentage for a certain product. So again, those are the same parameters I defined in the beginning. And now I have to know who to send the email to. Let's go ahead and use that profile information. Let's get the email address of the requester and put it in the two line. Um, so that's pretty straightforward. I sent an email. Um, now I'm going to add something to Dynamics. So um, you can see for Dynamics CRM, I have create a new record. Um, and in this case, um, I'm a member of, I think it's a Power Apps organization. So I can um, choose that organization. I can choose which entity I want to um, add a record for. So in this case, I want to add a new opportunity. And it completes against the set of, um, of uh, artifacts that I can add. So, and then potential customer. Um, let's go ahead and choose the display name of the user, uh, the profile of the, the user that we're sending a mail to. Um, and it's got a few required fields. I'll just fill them out. Um, has currency and uh, what topic. Um, I'm not going to go ahead and fill in all the fields because we'll be here all day. Um, but I'll go ahead and just uh, you know, give these required fields. Now you can see there's a ton of fields I could put in here if I want to really um, put a, um, an actual uh, opportunity in my database, I could do it that way. Um, so that's what I want to do when I approve a request. Now if I want to reject the request, I would just send an email back. Um, let's do Office 365 send email um, and then um, I would just do the inverse. So I would say your request has been uh, rejected and then uh, here in the body I'll say send approval email to has rejected your um, discount of some percent for some product and let's send it to the user's email. Cool. So that's what my, um, that's what my flow looks like. That's the whole thing. I'm going to send uh, approval email to the approver. I'm going to get the profile for the person who sent the request. I'm going to test to see if I approve or reject and then I'm going to send email back and optionally put um, a record into CRM. I can give it a name. Um, I'll call this uh, 0365 uh, Pulse Flow. I can give it a name and say done. OK. 
Okay, and uh, you can see I have a couple of backup flows just in case I did a typo or something stupid in my other flow. We can use one of the, the pre-baked ones. Um, but that's all I have to do to save the flow. And now it's up in the cloud. Um, so I'm going to go back to Power Apps and wire this thing up. So if I click on the button, uh, I can go to um, Action. What do I want to happen when the button is selected? Now I could type in a custom formula in on select, uh, but in this case I want to run a logic flow. So I'll click Logic Flows. And this is now enumerating the logic flows that I have um, saved to the cloud, one of which is this Office 365 Pulse Flow. Let's go ahead and pick that. And the next thing it says is complete the logic flows parameters in the formula bar. Um, so for that, I can click each parameter. Remember, I had a parameter for who to send the approval to, a parameter for the discount amount, and a parameter for the, um, the product. And so each one of those, I'll click them in turn and select which one I want to choose. So first, who do I want to send the approval to? Uh, in this case, it's the approver. Uh, then I want to click uh, the discount amount and then click uh, the amount. Then I want to click uh, for the product and then click the name of the product. So I basically just with a few clicks have wired up those parameters to the controls that I want to send. Um, and that should be all, all I need to do. Now let's go ahead and run this app. I'm going to pick a discount amount, let's say about 70%, and I'll request discount approval. Um, and with any luck, uh, I, my flow is, uh, is uh, flawless and it's going to um, send me an email which we're going to sit and wait for here. So there you go. It just came in. It says, an approval request. Please approve a discount of 70% for the Lumia 950. Uh, and then I can say approve or reject. So this was sent. Um, this is what the send approval mail action does. Uh, it sends this mail. I'll hit approve. And then it says, thanks, your response has been registered. If I come back to my email, now this is a little contrived scenario because I'm both the approver and I'm the person making the request, so I'm going to get both emails. Um, but we should see shortly uh, a mail should show up uh, saying that my request was approved. And here we go. We can see that the subject line has um, exactly what I put, typed in. Your request has been approved. And Brad and I at Microsoft.com uh, has approved your request for a discount of 70% for the Lord Mail. Um, so pretty straightforward. I basically have, you know, a custom action, a custom workflow. I didn't have to ask a pro developer to build it for me. Um, and uh, I was able to do something, you know, pretty pretty straightforward here. Um, and, of course, uh, because I approved it, I should get uh, a record into my CRM uh, as well. So I want to talk just a little bit about um, the IT side of the side of the story and the pro developer side of the story, um, just so you're aware of kind of how Power Apps is going to really empower um, IT to expose um, expose interesting information um, to uh, users in an enterprise to be able to build these kind of compelling experiences. So. Um, let's kind of let's go uh, jump into the deep end just a little bit. Uh, we're going to dip our toe in, in this. I'm going to show you kind of um, what it might look like to expose a custom API. Uh, we won't spend much time in code, um, but I'm going to go to uh, let's see Power Apps apps sample apps. I, ha I happen to have a uh, a sample um, API here. Um, really, all I want to really underscore with this is. Um, is that Visual Studio makes it really, really easy for uh, a pro developer to, um, to build APIs. And we have great templates to create um, uh, what we would call API apps in uh, Azure, um, and then publish them um, out, out to Azure as well. So um, this happens to be source code for uh, an API that's going to um, that's going to do reverse geocoding uh, uh, to look up an address from a latitude and longitude. So it takes in a couple of parameters, a latitude and longitude, and it's going to um, basically return a human readable address. Uh, and we won't really dig into what the code actually does. I mean, in this case, it's doing something kind of silly. It's going out to Google Maps or something and, and uh, using their APIs. Uh, it's just a wrapper. But it's not something that a business user would typically know how to do, right? Um, so let's say I'm an IT person and I built these this reverse geocoding API for people to use. Um, and uh, now if I want to turn around and publish that as a developer, I would right click this and I would just say publish. And uh, we have some great first class tooling for publishing these API apps directly into Azure. So if I choose uh, um, API apps, I can choose um, first how I want to expose metadata from my API. And we're standardizing on something called Swagger, 
um, which is just a way that an API can be self-descriptive about the operations and parameters that it supports. Um, and this is how Powerhouse will be able to discover exactly you know, what, um, what kind of functions are available from a given um, from a given API, so I would choose, say, automatic metadata generation. Um, and then uh, what this thing should do, uh, after it prompts me to sign in, apparently, um, is uh, it should actually enumerate the set of um, existing API apps that I have, as well as allow me to create new ones. So if I'd gone out to Azure and I created an API app that I wanted to publish into, um, it takes it a little bit uh, to enumerate, it looks like. But uh, well, we'll let that come back. Um, but I could also create new, and here I can choose to create a brand new API app in Azure. I can choose under what subscription I want uh, to do that. Yeah, I have my MX and MSDN subscription, um, and then uh, choose uh, you know various uh, parameters for how I want to publish this. But really, publishing into Azure is as simple as you know filling out a dialog. I don't know why this thing isn't coming back, but it should. Um, maybe I have too many API apps for it. Um, so uh, that's just kind of a quick glimpse at what a pro developer might see while they're building applications. You can do, you know, file new uh, API app, and you can build these uh, applications um, relatively quickly, and then publish them into an environment that can be managed. Now, the way that um, a developer or an IT professional would manage these APIs is using the Azure portal. And so let's dip out into the Azure portal and take a look at it. Um, I want to just kind of show you how um, IT has like a, a window on the like what's happening on the back end for Power Apps and a way to kind of centrally govern and manage which uh, which apps they're um, they've got in their enterprise, what APIs those apps are using, which users have access to those apps and APIs, um, what is the you know the usage and telemetry around those applications and so on. Uh, so Bradley, this is uh, this is Jennifer. Um, I think if we could maybe try to wrap up in the next uh, two to three minutes, and then we can save the last five or six minutes uh, for Q and A. We've had a lot of questions come in, so yeah. just doing a time check. Although this has been wonderful, so thank you so much for showing us uh, awesome. showing us this demo. Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm near the end of the demo, so I'll just kind of race through it. Uh, I want people to get a glimpse of this, so I think I can Perfect. do it in a few minutes. Um, so. Uh, let's quickly look at um, Power Apps here. So um, as an IT professional, I would come in and I would see um, this, uh, this app application service environment. This is an instance of an environment that is kind of serving as the back end for Power Apps. And this is actually a, a real environment we're using here and uh, collaborating with our own IT department, MSIT, to, uh, to kind of dog food some applications here. Um, so I can see that I can manage APIs, I can manage the apps in my organization, I can come out and look at all the APIs that I've, um, that I've got exposed. And like we've been working with our own IT department to start exposing real, real data from our IT department that we can build apps on. Like uh, we have a real estate and facilities API. Um, we have um, an API for, our, uh, for Microsoft Board of Directors. We're working on um, breaking news for our field sales uh, folks. Uh, our time and absence reporting systems, our org browser, um, our shuttle booking services. We've been building a bunch of these um, out there. And really registering an API is about as simple as kind of going out here and uh, giving it a name, like I could call it you know, Brad's um, address lookup or something. Um, and then I could choose what source I want to um, browse to. So once I've, ex once I've deployed my application to Azure from Visual Studio, I can go import a Swagger definition from that. Remember, I chose to automatically, uh, uh, automatically generate Swagger metadata. And a Swagger is just basically you know, some, some uh, um, uh, JavaScript or JSON that defines you know, what the endpoints for this and when, what the APIs look like. And that's really all I have to do to, to go register a new API. Um, and it looks like this thing was just uh, created. And now you can see I have this Brad Me address look up here. And I can go in and start setting properties on it, like which user should have access to this. Um, I can go ahead and add uh, new users here. And again, this is just using my Active Directory. So I should see everybody in Microsoft. I can add um, users and uh, security groups. So I could add, for example, I'll type the name of my, my manager. Um, like I could add Wade Wegner's organization, which would be my manager and all of my immediate peers, um, for example, and save that. And that's pretty much all I have to do to make um, an API available to them. And just kind of coming back to Power Apps, um, what does it look like on the consumption side? When I say insert new data, 
um, you can see that I've got a bunch of APIs here, uh, including those APIs that um, my IT department exposed to me. Like uh, this is another instance of the address lookup, not the one that I just deployed, but um, I have the org browser, I have time and absence reporting, I have the shuttle booking services, and I can just start um, building, you know, building against um, those APIs um, directly. And I'll just pick. It takes a little bit while for that for it to propagate. Uh, probably takes about five minutes before I would see that one that we just registered. But if I go ahead and add this sample one, um, I can just click on Add Data Source, and uh, this thing should be getting added. Maybe I didn't click the button. Let me click it one more time. Okay, so um, I have this address lookup API now, and if I go ahead and um, let's go back uh, down to this. Uh, let me click on this card. And let's give it a little bit of room. And uh, I'll go ahead and insert a insert a label. Um, the the only other part of my demo I was going to show you is that you know I could actually modify my workflow to send um, to grab from Dynamics some profile information about the person making the request, and I can also um, maybe uh, calculate their current location. Um, and so using this address lookup API, I can I get autocomplete against that, and it looks just like a regular function. I can say uh, give it a latitude and longitude, which just happens to be a built-in function in Power Apps. So location bang latitude and location bang longitude uh, are a couple of built-in functions I can use to calculate a current a current location. Uh, I'm prompted to let Power Apps access my location. I said yes, and then I can type the full address. Uh, is one of the properties I can get off of that. Again, I got statement completion all the way. Uh, it just looks like a regular function call, kind of no more complicated than I might type in, in Excel. Um, and here it can see that I'm in Microsoft Building 44 in Redmond. Um, calculated my, um, my address uh, just perfectly. So this is an example just to kind of show you how IT can kind of expose services and data um, in a way that is just immediately consumable to your typical non-developer right, right from in this environment. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and stop there and uh, open it up to questions. Thanks very much. Awesome. Thank you so much. This has been a, a very awesome demo. So we've had a couple of questions um, come in, and some of them I think we'll be able to get through pretty quickly. But the first one was, is there an offline story um, for this? If users have to be offline, is there any type of uh, story for that, or how would it work in an offline environment? Right. Um, today, there's there's not yet an offline story, but it is something we're very cognizant of um, and and working on. Um, uh, in fact, like my meeting just prior to this one was in fact on the story. We've been talking to um, to various folks on uh, inside the the org about about how to achieve some of that. Um, so we're working on it. Um, don't really have anything to announce about it right now, but um, it's 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 in the works. Awesome. Very cool. Um, can you render a Power Apps? app on a SharePoint site? Uh, so that uh, that's a question kind of about a web, like is there a web front end or a web experience, you know, for Power Apps? And yeah, we get asked that question a lot, uh, both from Office, uh, office users as well as um, the Office team. And um, uh, it is something that we are uh, actively working on. I think um, when I was talking to some of the slides, um, I did men kind of briefly mention that we will have a cross-platform story. It runs on iOS, Android, and Windows, um, but we're also working on a web story, both from an authoring perspective and a um, and uh, and a runtime perspective. So again, it's one of those uh, not today, but um, we're actively actively working on it. We have a team of people um, building out that experience today. Awesome. Um, how about are there any plans for anonymous access? <clears throat> anonymous access. Uh, that is kind of, in my mind, it's a little, it's part and parcel of that offline story, um, because you know, to take an, an app offline, if I want to run my apps from an airplane, I'm not going to have the opportunity necessarily to authenticate with an with an AD server. So uh, I think I think you'll see uh, something like that emerge, possibly as part of the offline story. But you know, I'm not not sure. It hasn't all shaken out. So awesome, awesome. Now you're going to love this question. You probably wish you had a dollar for every time you were asked it, but. Is Power Apps going to be a replacement for SharePoint workflows and InfoPath forms inside of SharePoint? That's a great question, boys. <laughs> I'm not even sure what I'm allowed to say. Um, now, I, I think so. Clearly, we're collaborating very deeply with Office on on Power Apps. Uh, everybody's excited about it. it uh, not just the Azure org. You know, this has um, uh, drummed up quite a lot of interest across Microsoft, and 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 of course, Power Apps is the is the newest member. 
um, you know, of of the office family. And so I, I think you know we um, uh, we're we're definitely working through what what it would require to do that. Um, I won't say it's an easy task, right, to, to, to be able to seamlessly migrate all the InfoPath uh, forms, but we've definitely done a lot of legwork around it, um, and I can say that we're, we're, we're actively working on it. Um, but as of today, as of this very moment, um, I, I can't tell you, you know, with a straight face that we've got a solution, um, you know, that we've got a, a, you know, a buttoned-up solution that's going to give you parity there yet. Um, but do know that that uh, it's something that we're we're very conscious of and and we are working hard on. Very awesome, very awesome. Um, how about how does Power Apps auto render SharePoint column settings? And so when we think about that, we think of like rich text that's in a SharePoint column or um, images. I saw how the images came over in your demo. But if there was a choice field or a manage metadata field, how would that render inside of of Power Apps. If I updated it in SharePoint, would Power Apps be updated if if drop downs changed, or does it render it and separate it, or is right. it kind of a fluid experience? Yeah, you know, we aren't that sophisticated today. Um, it's uh, something that. So when you saw that I could create an app from data, like I could point to a SharePoint list and it would scaffold out stuff, um, we're able to get some metadata from SharePoint, and we're doing you know the best we can to kind of to kind of optimize the experience that we can generate by default for those. Um, and different backends are going to give us different different amounts of, of metadata. And so we're trying to build an app from data experience that's going to let people build these kinds of applications across lots of different data sources, like whether it's an Excel file or a dynamic CRM or a Salesforce database or a or you know SharePoint list. And so um, and so to some extent we've got kind of a, a least common denominator solution, you know, where where we're gonna like for Excel, for example, we can't get anything from it. But like from SQL or SharePoint, we might be able to get def default values. It might be something that we can get from SharePoint or, or SQL that we couldn't get from from uh, Excel. So uh, we've we've kind of we've been working on kind of an O data contract uh, for starters. Um, and, and it's sort of the way we're doing app from data is sort of it's an additional contract above and beyond just kind of being a regular uh, uh, connector or data connector API app. Um, there's like an additional set of uh, services we require from those backends that we would be able to scaffold applications from to do app from data from. Um, and that contract is being is constantly being shaped. I mean we've gotten gotten it to a point here where you can see the demos working, um, but you know, I think you're going to see it evolve. Uh, other things that we need to do, I think, is take better advantage of like the Office Graph and some of the like deeper, richer metadata that we're going to be able to get from that. Um, that's also on our radar to be able to do. Okay. Um, so as as we start to improve that that API contract, we are going to be, the, the whole point is to be able to do richer scaffolding um, when we get richer metadata. And awesome. um, now, in terms of would that would it dynamically update if the data on the back end updated? I, I think that's a great goal. I think that's something we should definitely consider and look at. Um, but I think we're still in the process of kind of going going through and evolving this. Okay. Uh, so with this. that being said, and since we have a bunch of uh, SharePoint people on the phone, where is the best channel for us to communicate with you guys? Do you guys have a Power Apps uh, user voice or some place where we can go and and share these features? Like if I just have to have this field and it's going to solve all my problems, where would I be able to communicate that um, to your team? Or what's the best approach for us to you know communicate uh, wants and feature requests and different things like that? Yeah. Gosh, that's a great question, and it's one that I absolutely should have an answer for. And I have to, <laughs> I have to admit, I, I I may not, I may not know the exact channels that we, because we just launched. I stumped you. I'm sorry, Bradley. <laughs> we just launched two, two weeks ago, and I know that like a lot of the channels we were using before, kind of internally, and when we had right. like private onboarding, you know, it's all different now, and I and I may not know. Um, what I can yes, do. We can always find out, and I will share that with IT Unity um, and the folks here. So no big deal. We can easily yeah. get easily get that information. I'm sure you guys have a user voice or will have a user voice soon. Um, most products do. So uh, we we must here. Uh, actually, look. So I, I, am I still sharing my desktop? Can you see it? Um, yeah, I can see it. Okay. Um, so I'm on the Power Apps portal. I just went to web.powerapps.com. Um, I 
don't know what you see if you're not onboarded, though. That's a good question. Maybe I should log out first. Yeah, but, I don't think you see anything. You don't see the question mark or anything like that. So uh, here we have community. We have all this great stuff. Um, feedback. I, I don't know where these things go, but <laughs> <laughs> okay, that looks like that looks like just a like a feedback form. Let me actually go to community. I will absolutely get you the right information. <laughs> you know, honestly, there's a um, so there's a PM on my team who's in charge of like really being our our um, the face to all all of our customers, and that's Claire Fang. If you know who that is, yes, Claire is wonderful. I've been uh, working with her for several months on this, but every channel that I have with her right now is kind of a closed lockdown channel. So I'm sure there is um, some place, but to be perfectly honest, I don't know the answer to it either. So we will get everyone that answer. Oh, Dan said yes. There's powerapps.uservoice.com. So awesome. we're good. <laughs> so yes, we do have a we do have a user voice. Thank you, Dan. Um, for posting, uh, for posting that in there. So very cool. cool. You yeah. guys can go. And, and Claire can give you a, a laundry list of all the all the places you can get engaged. Uh, I would encourage you to just get that list from her and, and share it out. Most definitely. And I think we have uh, one or two final questions. Um, if you were just getting started, I know you had a lot of the uh, formulas and stuff like that that you were kind of preloading and going going to. If you were just getting started with that, I know it's as easy as Excel, but where would somebody start to learn how to develop the skills to know what can be put into those um, locations? Yes. So we have... We have documentation. Uh, I wish I knew where all this stuff was, because um, I you know, the last time I saw it, it was not published yet. Um, so let me. Gosh, I need to get you. The, I need to get you some more pointers. Um, let's look, let's try help. Maybe help has something. There we have. Um, no, that's not it. We have documentation. Um, okay, the documentation will be coming soon. So at least yeah. if it's not if it's not visible yet, it should be out there soon. If you've been onboarded, you should already have access to it. We have, like, we've written a ton of documentation, including, like, an entire, I know we've got, uh, like, a, uh, a function reference. There was okay. an old awesome. one, there was an old one for Project Sienna back when this was, this was under that moniker. Um, and many of those functions still apply, so believe it or not, like, like I, I use all the time, or I, I was using all the time before we wrote new, um, uh, new documentation, I was just going out to Project Sienna Function Reference, and uh, there's a TechNet article out there. Uh, this oh, is ancient, yeah, this is ancient, by the way, um, but it's it's still v very valid. If you look out here, you've got like a huge list of all the, all the functions and, and kind of some samples of how to awesome. use them. Now, definitely the API service area of Power Apps has changed a bit. Like a lot of the, the way you do data access, uh, it's quite different, um, and I know the new docs address all of that. So, um, yeah, we just need to get find the right pointer to, to the, get to the real docs, but it, they do exist, trust me. Awesome, and I know we're running out of time, so I'm going to ask our last question. Um, this is always a good one, and I, I always feel like I'm putting people on the spot for this one, but um, when is this coming? So when is it going to actually light up and be available? I know that E5 plans um, have now hit, and they're out there, and they're getting ready to launch, and Power Apps is one of the things that's included in E5, but is there any type of timeline or anything you can share with us on when we might to ex you know start to expect to see um, some of these features become available in early release versus the beta that they're in right now? Yeah, that's the that's the sixty million dollar question, I guess. Uh, <laughs> uh, all I can say is all I can say is that we expect to go public early next year, and okay. um, by early I mean really early, <laughs> if that helps, <laughs> like. You, know, you won't be waiting long, but um, uh, that will that will at least open the floodgates to everybody who wants to, um, you know, to get access to the bits in their current state. Now, how long will we remain in a preview state as opposed to like a uh, a GA, you know? Right. Uh, uh, that could state. be a long time. I mean, it that's depends. a much that's a much bigger question and one that I can't I can't answer. But I can absolutely say uh, we'll be public in in the early part of the, the year. Will it uh, follow along some of the same patterns that we saw with groups and delve, and um, even the video portal where it was in um, kind of the the early release and um, stuff like that, and we kept seeing features or you know features made and then it slowly rolled out. Um, and came to GA for everybody. Are we going to see kind of a similar pattern um, with that? 
I, I think so, yeah. I mean, we're running this as a SaaS service. It's going to go through phases like that. Yeah. Okay. Beautiful. Well, Bradley, thank you so much. This has been one of the best um, power-up demos that I've been able to sit in on, and I've sat on quite a few of them, and so I just appreciate you coming. You're um, welcome. So much. This has been wonderful. We will get this recorded and up on the IT Unity site. So, guys, this has been a wonderful show. This is a great way to end the 2015 season for me. So we're going to be kicking off with the Office 365 Pulse again in January. So I look forward to seeing everybody. I hope you guys all have a wonderful holiday with your family and friends. And we will see you guys in January. But thank you guys so much. And um, we've enjoyed having you. And we will see you guys next time. Thanks. Great. Thank you.